hostility to the world and <clears throat> to the enemy, the great enemy, Satan, the tempter. And here, here Paul reflects on having to leave early. He was only there for three Sabbaths and he had to leave early. He's forced out. And he's at Athens, and now they're deciding, well, I need to send Timothy back to address some issues, some follow-up, if you will. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Paul writes, Therefore, when we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith, so that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. For indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer affliction, and so it came to pass, as you know. For this reason, when I could endure it no longer, I also sent to find out about your faith for fear that the tempter might have tempted you and our labor would be in vain. To be a church that Christ wants us to be, facing pressures of various kinds, it is necessary for us to develop a sense of stability. Stability uh, if you will, as a church, but also as families within the church, and not just families, but as individuals as well. For ourselves, for new believers. And we must be willing, as all churches must be willing, to follow up with those who, uh, that have been under our care. In various ministry opportunities, various children have been under our care, kids that, well, quite frankly, that we would have never imagined would be under our care at one time or another. But the Lord is gracious to us and has provided so abundantly, and, and, uh, and being able to reach children from different cultures and being able to share with them the truth of Jesus Christ. For our youth, and the various ministry opportunities in the women's Bible study and when the men get together. The question arises then, what do we do for those exploring the faith? What do we do for those new to the faith? What do we do for those needing to dig deeper? What do we do for those needing to discern good and evil? That is... We as, a, as believers in Jesus Christ, it's, it's necessary for us to develop a, a, an ethic, if you will, to look at the scriptures and to see the standard that God has set forth and to train people to look at that very standard so that they may gauge their lives by it and not by the shifting uh, shadows and sands of the world. What do we do for those seeking to mature and then asking that overriding question, what does this look like in a church? Well, as we look more closely at the text, we, we ask a question, what was Paul's concern here in terms of the Thessalonian situation? Well, certainly we've already mentioned he didn't get to spend as much time with them as he would have liked. If you read the passages back in the book of Acts and Luke's uh, <clears throat> events and history of things there, you find that he was there and able to minister for three Sabbaths, and then uh, there were some people riled up and began to throw accusations at him and began to drive him out and his team out. So he wasn't there as long as he would have liked to really ground them as he desired. Well, you add to that not only a shortened ministry, but you add to that oppositions and conflicts and sufferings, persecutions during the ministry, and that just multiplies your concerns. 
So as the word of truth went forward, the gospel went out, and there were those in Thessalonica that were being converted and coming to know the Lord, then those uh, Gentiles in the same area decide that they're going to attack these new believers because they're embracing something new and this isn't what our culture is about. And, and so they attack them. And so Paul, in the end, having been driven out, is very much concerned with their faith. You know, was it secure? Was it stable? Was it growing? Was it, had it been solidified enough? What was the solution? Well, Paul did something about it. Though he himself could not go, he was able to send Timothy. <clears throat> and Timothy was able to follow up, if you will, follow up with them. And a couple of phrases here stand out. I sent Timothy to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith. When I could endure it no longer, I also sent to find out about your faith. It became very personal, right, with Paul. It was very personal to him. He had gone out. God had given him these people who had converted to, in, uh, to Christianity, had turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, you see. And he needed to know about their faith. Two issues, then, that we find here in this passage that can corrupt faith. Afflictions and persecutions. When you are under the gun and under fire, encountering very trying times, the temptation is begin to question God to question who he is, if he's real, if he's really there, if he's really concerned, and if he is, why is he letting me go through this, right? Why me? And that's the very thing that begins to undermine faith because none of those things really detract from who God is and his worthiness of worship. Another issue then is also worldly temptations, or we might say cares of this world. Cares of this world, things that concern us as to this world. I need to make a living, and I get caught up in my job, and I work so much, and I need a break, but I don't want to go worship now because I need to rest. And, and in fact, that is where we find our rest, is in Christ. But we try and shift and find other avenues for it. <clears throat> we deal with the effects of sin as well, wherein arise persecutions, tribulations, and troubles, but also other things as well, disease and, and other corruptible things that creep in into our lives. What are our concerns? Well, we too are concerned about opposition to the gospel, are we not? Of course we are. Fundamentally, fundamentally, we need to see it as a worldview problem. A worldview problem. Especially concerning our operating assumptions, we call them, our presuppositions. That is, those things that we hold in spite of everything else that sort of make us tick, make us decide this instead of that and move here instead of there and those kinds of things. There are beliefs, assumptions about the nature of the universe, uh, about the nature of mankind and about the nature of the fundamental problem of mankind and the answer to that problem. Here in thinking of the nature of the universe, you have evolution, 
uh, spontaneous creation. They call it creation, but it's really not creation in the sense that God did something. It's self-arising, and therefore it is equivalent to a chance or accidental universe. And the atheist who holds to evolution attributes to matter and energy the attributes of God who has life in himself. And the unbeliever says, no, matter energy has life in itself and it will create life and it will bring forth all things as you see. Or you view creation as purposeful creation. That is, it is heading somewhere. It originated from somewhere. It's heading somewhere purposefully. That is, God, we believe then, stands back of it all. And God really does have life in himself, and therefore he is able to create life. Nowhere has any scientist been able to put in an experiment creation from nothing let alone being able to bring forth life from that which is lifeless. It's never been achieved, and I don't think it ever will be. Continuing to think about it as a worldview problem and our operating assumptions, we think of the nature of mankind on the one hand uh, we're either simply an evolved animal or we are, in a Christian worldview, we are an image bearer. And beloved, it is so important that you grasp that you are an image bearer and that you cannot escape it. God's image is imprinted on each and every one of you. That's right. And you cannot escape it. The unbelieving world seeks to suppress that but can't do so because they're living in God's world and because they are image bearers still. So there's some benefit to that, right? We discover things. We discover medicines. We're able to advance technologically. We're able to do things that are for the benefit or welfare of society at large. We're able to do good works in the sense of an unbeliever just as well as an, a believer can jump in the water and save somebody from drowning, you see. Those kinds of things, that's of benefit to us as a society. But the unbeliever who embraces evolution can see himself no more as an animal, just simply an organism going on in life seeking to survive its environment. Then you turn to the fundamental problem of mankind and you see it as something external versus something internal. That is usually we view it as something happening to me and unfortunately, and I see it as more pronounced in society today, we're becoming more of a victim. We're developing a victim mentality because if it weren't for you and you and this and that, then I'd be okay. And that's hogwash. And I understand that we're born into certain circumstances, some of us better than others. And some of these things are out of our control, but God is in control. You see, in an evolutionary mindset, there is no one in control. And it is accident, and it is by chance. In an evolutionary standpoint, though, we see it as usually external, although now today we are looking at gene manipulation, right? For the defects of humanity, maybe, maybe as a baby I can examine the genome and if he's missing something here, we can sort of implant something and solve the problem. But the, the, the problem with that, beloved, is that no matter what kind of physical manipulations we do, it will never reach the human heart. It will never reach the sin nature that we each have. And that's the Christian worldview. It is internal to us. 
The problems that I have are mostly my own. Certainly people can wrong me, but my reactions are mine. My attitudes are mine. Nobody can force those on me, and out of the heart come what? The evil thoughts and murders and adulteries and all of those things, beloved. When you are at your worst, you get a glimpse of the depravity of the human heart. And you might say to yourself, well, that's not really me. And you might hear that in conversation, open conversation. Well, I didn't really mean that. I, I'm not really that kind of person. But in that moment, you really were that kind of person. That's the point. That's wherein this conflict lies. And it's only in the Christian worldview that we can identify it appropriately. And then the answer to the problem is usually something within mankind. I can better myself. I can get the right kind of animal training, the stimulus response training, and, and so on. And I can learn to overcome my environment. I can learn to better myself. Uh, humanism, right? We better ourselves as human beings. And the problem is, even in doing that, we still cannot reach the human heart. And it is only in the Christian worldview wherein we find that the answer is external to us. That is, it is Jesus Christ who came into the world and gave his life and shed his blood so that the penalty of sin might be addressed and the power of sin. And beloved, he makes you new. He makes you new. And what greater news is that? When I can see myself at my worst and understand that Christ then is at work in me to continue to transform me into something new. That I don't have to remain that way. It's also a friendship problem. James chapter 4 verse 4 he says you adulteresses do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God now the world can be an inclusive term for all people groups for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son it wasn't written as it could have been written for God so loved his people Israel that he gave his only begotten son but rather it is expanded beyond the Jewish nation now, God so loved the world, it is not just the Jew, it is everyone from every ethnic background. The doors are flinging open, and Jesus calls to everyone to come to him. The world can be viewed in the scriptures, though, as that which is set in opposition to God in terms of value and message. It suppresses the truth and unrighteousness, and it seeks to make a name for itself and allows for humanity an autonomous deception that they are, to de they are able to determine for themselves what is good and what is evil. 1 John 2, 15 to 17, do not love the world, therefore, right? Don't embrace the value and the, the values and the message the world espouses. Don't embrace the way of the world, that which is opposed and in opposition to the true and living God. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him, John writes. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away and also its lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. The boastful pride of life, thinking that I'm all that, thinking that in and of myself, I am just something else. And I can determine for myself my way in the world instead of listening to God. That's the boastful pride of life. 
refusing to acknowledge that it is God who is at work in you and through you giving you ability to go to work and make a living, make a living to supply your every need. Instead, the boastful pride of life says, I'm all in all and I do this all by my own hand and I have no need of God. We are concerned about the human heart as well, and I've got to hurry. Captured in the parable of the soils, but there were those seed uh, thrown beside the road. They're trampled underfoot. It's a hard path. Here Satan takes away the word that was sown. There's the rocky places, and that's more pertinent for this passage here in Thessalo Thessalonians. The rocky places, the people received with joy, but there's no root, therefore it's temporary. And here affliction or persecution arises, and they fall away. And this was the concern for Paul. Persecution and affliction had arisen, and he wanted to make sure of their faith, that they wouldn't fall away like these portrayed in this parable of Jesus in the rocky soil where they turn away, they fall away. And of course, there's the thorny places as well, where you hear the word, and you know it's the right thing, but your concerns about the world, what will people think of me? Maybe I'll lose my friends. All manner of things that begin to crop up and begin to what? Choke it out. And so Paul is very concerned about these believers that this is not happening uh, to them. And we are concerned, therefore, about the well-being of God's people, especially new converts, but everyone, really. So we need to know that afflictions, literally the word is tribulations, are part of life as we live in an evil age. Right? Verse 3. So that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. It's been fixed for us. It's natural. If you embrace Jesus, there's going to be conflict. It is an evil age. Galatians 1.4. Starting at verse 3, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age. We need to know then that troubles are a part of this age so we need not become overly disturbed by them as if troubles signify the falsity of the Christian faith. Instead, instead, troubles actually portend ultimate judgment. Philippians 1.28, starting at verse 127, verse 27 of Philippians 1. Paul writes there, Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Here's the key. In no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. The very act of being persecuted, the very act of suffering affliction, of somebody picking on you because you're a Christian or any other manner of thing, portends destruction for them and salvation for you. We need to grab, grasp that perspective in life. All of these things, you see, as much and as difficult as they are now, will come back and haunt the unbeliever because God will call them to account in fact Paul goes on then and says for to you it has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in him so it's a gift of God to believe in the first place but not only to believe but also to suffer for his sake it has been granted by God for you to do that 
Isn't that interesting? So now, knowing what we know about this age, the nature of troubles, the tempter and the world, we must seek to be appropriately grounded to meet the challenges then that are thrown our way. Like Paul, we must be careful to check on the faith of our brothers and sisters. I so much appreciate each and every one of you for praying for me. Because I, I can, I was shaken. I'll tell you that. You know, and in that moment, that that split moment, you decide: Is God worthy? Do I give up on him? Do I give up? Do I just resign myself to something else? You know, and as all of these things flood your mind, both positive and negative, but you get this other stuff. And it makes it hard. But when you have brothers you can lean on, and literally, literally, in my case, lift me up, hold me up, literally. Well, that's very encouraging. And that's, that's kind of the attitude that we need to have as brothers and sisters in Christ. Not to be afraid to ask, how is your faith? How is your faith? To make sure that believers are properly grounded, established, strengthened. So we have women's Bible studies. We have men's Bible studies. We have kids club, youth. Make sure that believers are properly encouraged. So let's unpack this for a a couple of moments. This is where we're going to end. We're going to look at each of these. We are to strengthen others in their faith. To strengthen others. To strengthen literally is as setting up something so that it remains immovable. You think of a tree outside planted and rooted down. You can't move it. You think of something, a fence post or something else that's that's you know, you pour the concrete into the hole, you put the post in before that, you fill it up, you, and it sets in place, and you can't yank it out of its place. That's what it means to be strengthened, to be fixed in place. Then figuratively, then, to cause someone to become stronger in the sense of more firm in, uh, and unchanging in attitude or belief, to grow, uh, to develop even more conviction about the truth of God's word and who he is. Because that, beloved, is what will carry you through. The word is used of Peter in many places, but I pulled out these couple of them here. Used of Peter to strengthen his brethren. Listen, Simon, Simon, this is Luke 22, 31 and 32. Jesus is talking to Peter and about his betrayal and denial and all of that. But he says something here. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. So something was going to happen to Peter that was going to shake him to his very core and challenge his faith. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned again... So Peter will have turned away, but he will have turned again. He will have repented and come back. When you have turned again, he says, strengthen your brothers. Strengthen your brothers. Then it's used as being established in the truth, 2 Peter 1.12. This is the passage here in 2 Peter that talks about, uh, for this very reason, also applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence in your moral excellence, knowledge, and so on. We did a series on that. And then he ends this way, Therefore I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them. I'm going to still remind you, but you know them, but I'm going to reinforce them. And have been established in the truth which is present with you. How do you become really strengthened and fixed? You're exposed, you're exposed to the truth, the truth of God's word. This 
is what plants you in place so that you are immovable. The more you know about who God is and His ways in the world, the more firmly planted and strengthened you will be. As an aside, Colossians 2, verses 6 and 7. The word isn't found here, but I like what Paul says here about these same kinds of things. He says, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in Him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. These same kinds of words come into play here about the believer's life. We are also to encourage others in their faith. To encourage is literally to call to one side. Then figuratively to instill someone with courage or cheer. And and sometimes literally it is that. When I found out that I had cancer and I called the elders, literally they came to my side. And, And again, held me up. It's like... It's like putting your arm, you know, under their arm, wrapping their arm around your neck and putting your arm up and holding someone up to encourage them to continue on. I will go with you in the way. And by the way, beloved, that is what the Holy Spirit promises to do. To go with you, to come alongside of you and to minister to you. What would a group of Christians need who are suffering afflictions or tribulations? Courage to face whatever onslaught to their faith. Courage, right? To be encouraged. What is the source of that encouragement? Well, it is the teaching or that which is taught. Paul, in writing to Titus in chapter 1, verses 5 through 11, talks about uh, appointing elders in every city and and he talks about the qualifications, and in, and in doing so, this is what he says. Holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. There's our word, exhort in sound doctrine. That word exhort is the word encourage to encourage in sound doctrine. The sound doctrine is the teaching, the the Christian faith, the truths of the Christian faith, to impart those to others that serves then as an encouragement to another. So it's grounded in what is taught And we are to check on the faith of our brothers and sisters. Paul says, I also sent to find out about your faith. Not only was Timothy sent to strengthen and encourage them, but he was sent to find out about their faith. In fact, for fear that the tempter might have tempted you and our labor would have been in vain. We're to check on the faith of our brothers and sisters. We must take seriously the role of the tempter. We often downplay Satan. We often disregard him. He certainly is a defeated foe, but he is an angry foe. And he is one who opposes Christ at every turn. The role of the tempter. We must take that seriously in overthrowing the faith of some. So we ought not to take life and faith for granted, and we ought not to take the faith of our brothers and sisters for granted. Some some are maybe challenged very deeply in their lives, and we're not to, to go there and berate them and say, well, just have faith. Now, sometimes in a life, faith you're shaken to the core very depth of your person. And you don't need to be told to simply straighten up. You need someone to come alongside of you to encourage you and to strengthen you, you see. And that's what we're able to do for each other. 
Life can be hard, confusing, disruptive, and our faith can be shaken. We can be disturbed or agitated or stirred up by the things of this life. And in fact, P, uh, Paul says here specifically, look at, look at the transition between the end of verse 2 and the beginning of verse 3. I've sent Timothy to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith. And you see that next two words, or at least in my translation, so that. That's a purpose clause. For this purpose, you could actually say. For this purpose, that no one would be disturbed, stirred up by these afflictions. you might see it the right you might see it from God's perspective that you might know bottom line that the things that happen external to you cannot change the work of God in your heart do you understand that and sometimes that's hard when you're in the middle of it trust me and you're shaken but you come to realize that none of that changes the promise of God. None of that stuff out there that happens to me can change the relationship and the nature of that relationship that God has with me. And as hard as it might blow and as the storm strikes against the house and seeks to make it fall, it will stand because it's founded upon the rock, you see. Life is often unpredictable, but there are things of which we may be sure. We may be sure of opposition of the world, and we may be sure of our trustworthy God. Okay, you get it? You, you may be sure that the world will oppose you in various ways. It may approve, right, of some good works. Oh, that's a great work. But the minute you begin to talk about Jesus Christ, they want to cut you off. Well, we don't want to get religious here. As if you can do something apart from God. It may applaud you on the one hand, but it seeks to undermine you on the other hand. You see, moralism is good, but the world wants Jesus out of the picture. And as a believer in Jesus Christ, you must never divorce yourself from him. And the opposition of the world may result in some troubles. But we have our trustworthy God of whom we may be sure. He is always faithful and true. He is always faithful and true. And what happens to me does not negate his faithfulness and it does not negate the truth. And he is always there for his people to carry them along, to carry them along in life. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word for us today. The concerns that Paul had in this little church in Thessalonica can be the same kinds of concerns that we ourselves have in this day and age as well. Father, help us to take heed of these words to being vessels that sincerely are concerned about each other's faith concerned enough that we might strengthen and encourage each other as to our faith so that we might be fixed firmly and immovable in the things of this life that the onslaught of the things of this life that stand in opposition to you and so Lord continue to encourage your hearts and strengthen us Uphold our faith, and may we, though be shaken, never waver in our trust in you. And so, Lord, hear us, we pray, through Jesus with thanksgiving. Amen.
Our ushers are going to come at this time to receive our offering for this Sunday.